Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering placenta previa. Now, if you haven't watched separation or um, separation of the placenta or placenta abruptio, that's fine. You can watch this first, but then watch that video because I guarantee you, if you're taking ma maternity labor and delivery as a nursing student, even if you're done, you graduated and you're studying for NCLEX, you need to know the difference between placenta previa and placenta abruptio or abruptio placenta or separation of the placenta. You have to know the difference between the two. So guys, before we get started, please like this video. If you really like my channel, you appreciate the content that I'm bringing your way and you want me to keep going, I need you to support me and support this channel. How can you do that? Like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Share my content, share it on your social media profile, or you can share it with a classmate, a coworker, even your nursing instructor. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And also almost daily, you can find me covering different um, nursing content on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. All right, guys. So without much further ado, let's get started. Placenta previa. So let's look and see what it is. It says placenta previa. This is when the placenta is implanted in the lower segment such that it either completely or partially covers the cervical os or is close enough to the cervix to cause bleeding when that cervix dilates or effaces. Now, let's talk about this, guys. When the cervix dilates, what happens? It's getting larger. That opening is getting larger, right? It widens. When the cervix effaces, it gets thinner because what's happening, it's folding up on top of each other and it gets thinner. So when it either dilates or effaces, there's going to be bleeding because of the location of where it's attaching. That is placenta previa. Let's talk about the incidence in etiology. In addition to a history of having a C-section, what else would place the patient at risk for placenta previa? Other risk factors, advanced maternal age, being 35 to 45 years age years old, multi-parity, history of a prior suction and curatage, smoking, living at higher altitudes is also a risk factor. It appears that Asian women have the highest risk for placenta previa. Placenta previa also occurs more frequently in women carrying male fetuses, women who had placenta pre uh, previa previously, they're more likely um, to have this problem in the subsequent pregnancy and previous uh, C-section and curatage. Clinical manifestations. Placenta uh, previa typically characterized by, look at this, painless. This is your key. Where's painless? I just saw it. There it is. No, that's the pain. This is a huge difference. Painless, bright red vaginal bleeding during the second or third trimester. When it comes to test questions, the only difference in uh, clinical manifestations they may give you may be painful bleeding or painless. Painful bleeding, that's your placenta abruptio. Okay, separation of the placenta. Painless bleeding, that is your uh, placenta previa. Make sure you guys know the difference. Placenta previa, painless, bright red vaginal ble bleeding. Why is it bright red? Because the blood's fresh, okay? The bleeding is associated with this eruption of the placental blood uh, vessels that occurs with stretching and thinning of the lower uterine segment. Remember, it's attaching to that lower uterine segment. So whenever that uh, cervix uh, dilates or it effaces, we see that bleeding. The vital signs, look at this guys, the vital signs might be normal even with heavy blood loss. Why? Look at this. The pregnant woman can lose up to 40% of her blood volume without showing signs of shock. So we can't really rely too much on the vital signs because normally, such in an abruptio placenta, what do you see? You see tachycardia, heart rates up, blood pressure is down, heart's trying to compensate for the blood loss. Not so much in placenta previa, guys. Clinical presentation and decreasing urinary output are better indicators of blood loss than the vital signs. 
Mm -hmm. Think about it. Decrease urine output. Remember, guys, whenever you're losing a lot of blood, your body's going to try to survive no matter what. So we're going to see that urine output go down. So seeing that urine output go down along with that painless bleeding, uh-oh, you better be thinking placenta previa. Uh, the fetal heart rate is normal unless major detachment of the placenta occurs. The presenting part of the fetus usually remains high because the placenta occupies the lower uterine segment. So because of this, look at this, the fungal height is often greater than expected for gestational age. Usually when we see the fungal height greater than expected for gestational age, it's what? They're carrying twins or maybe triplets. This is one fetus in here, and the reason that we'll see that fundal height hi, fundus higher than we would normally expect it is because what? Look, it's occupying um, the uh, lower uterine segment. It remains high. Let's keep going. Maternal and fetal outcomes. The uh, major maternal complications that's associated with placenta previa is hemorrhage. Them bleeding to death. Remember, guys, that oxygenated blood is supposed to be perfusing the patient, mommy, right? But the um, the placenta, that's how the fetus is getting its oxygen nutrition as well. If excessive bleeding cannot be controlled, hysterectomy may be necessary. Diagnosis. All women with painless, not painful, painless vaginal bleeding after 20 weeks of gestation should be assumed to have placenta previa until it's been proven otherwise. And then they'll do ultrasound, transabdominal ultrasound, transvaginal. Um, here we go. Transabdominal ultrasound exam uh, should be performed initially followed by transvaginal scan. Nursing diagnoses, what types of nursing diagnoses would we see with that patient that has placenta previa? Decreased urinary output, why? Because of that blood loss, secondary to the placenta previa. Deficient fluid volume, again, because of all that blood loss. Ineffective, ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion, because of that blood loss. Anxiety, of course, mom's going to be anxious. She's going to be nervous. She's going to be worried about her health. She's going to be worried about the baby's health. And she's going to have anxiety just because of that decreased oxygen that's flowing in her blood because she's losing blood. Grieving, she doesn't know. And it doesn't have to be actual grieving. It could be potential grieving because there is a chance that she may lose a fetus. Expected management. Expectant management, that's observation and bed rest, is implemented if the fetus is at less than 36 to 37 weeks of gestation with normal fetal growth, and they don't have any other complications. At that stage, we're going to do expected management. Patient's going to get large IV access. Usually, it's two, two large bore IV needles are going to be initiated immediately. Why? To replace the fluid that they're losing or may potentially lose. We're going to do lab tests. We're going to be looking at the H and H. That's going to let us know about that blood loss. We're going to be looking at the platelet count. We're going to be looking at the coagulation studies. We're going to do a type and screen just in case we have to give them blood. If the woman is less than 34 weeks gestation, antenatal corticosteroids should be administered. Why? Think about it, guys. We want to make sure that that fetus can survive outside of the womb. So why are we giving the steroids? Surfactant. We want to increase that surfactant so that the, that, so that the fetus can survive outside of the womb. Tocolytic medications can be given if the vaginal bleeding is associated with uterine contractions. It's too soon. If the bleeding stops, the woman will most likely be placed on bed rest with bathroom privileges and limited activity. They're giving you examples. Whenever they give you examples in, um, what are these called? These are called quotation marks. What are they called? Parentheses. 
Are these parentheses? Yes, parentheses. If I'm wrong, tell me in the comments. But whenever you see these guys, guess what? They make beautiful select all that apply. So make sure you know that these. What are they able to do? They're able to use the bathroom, shower, or move around in the hospital room for 15 to 30 minutes at a time, four times a day. Okay? No vaginal or rectal examinations are performed, and the woman's told to avoid intercourse. No intercourse. That's important to know as well. Ultrasound exams are going to be performed so serially. That means back to back to back to back, okay? They're going to be performed serially to assess the placental location and the fetal growth. Patient's going to get nutritional counseling and iron supplements to avoid anemia because with that blood loss, patient can be anemic. Placenta previa should always be considered a potential emergency because things can go left very quickly. The possibility always exists that the woman will require an emergency C-section. C-section, that's major surgery, guys. Home care, uh, if bleeding resumes, the nurse, excuse me, she'll need to return to the hospital immediately. Active management. If the woman definitely has placenta previa and she's at or beyond 36 weeks gestation, then birth is appropriate. If the bleeding is excessive or continues or there's concerns about the condition of the fetus, again, birth is indicated. And look what it says, guys, regardless of gestational age, because our choices are really limited at this point. Let's keep going. The maternal condition is assessed frequently for decreasing blood pressure, increasing pulse rate, changes in le levels of consciousness, and oliguria. All of those, what do those tell us? Bleeding. Once you start bleeding out, your blood pressure goes down. Your heart tries to compensate. That's why the heart rate increases. Level of consciousness decreases because that's less oxygenated blood that's going to the brain. And oliguria, your kidneys start to shut down. It's trying to preserve the fluid, the little bit of fluid that you have. And it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's causing a detour of the oxygenated blood that you have to go to the vital organs. So these are the signs and symptoms that you expect to see when the patient's bleeding out. You're also going to do um, electronic fetal monitoring for signs of hypoxia. Guys, that is your placenta previa. That's it. That's your placenta previa. Make sure you guys review not only this video, but placenta, placenta, I guess so time tie. What's coming here? Right here. Abruptio placenta or placental abruption or separation of the placenta. Make sure you guys go back and watch that video as well so you guys know and understand the difference between the two, the clinical manifestations and the nursing care. And that's it for this video, guys. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe, share my content. When you share my content, you're supporting me, you're supporting this channel, and you're allowing more content to come your way. And don't forget the audio lessons I have on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also, October 30th, I have a live uh, NCLEX review I'm doing for you guys right here on YouTube. It's going to be live Sunday, October 30th time to be announced. And don't forget, you guys can catch me covering different types of questions almost daily on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.